our planet and life on it will be fine. It'll, it'll take several million years, but the planet will be fine. Human future on the planet is not assured though. Hello everyone, I'm Steve Friedman, Head of Research and Sustainability Thematic Equities here at Pictay Asset Management. Today we'll be talking about the deep sea metal industry and its role in humanity's transition from fossil fuels to a low carbon and sustainable economy. The climate crisis is one of the greatest challenges humanity is facing in the 21st century, and our overconsumption of natural resources is one of the main catalysts. In recent years, Greater awareness of such topics has led to increased focus on shifting energy production to renewable sources, improving resource efficiency and making the economy more circular, and protecting and fostering biodiversity and ecosystem services. We've identified these as trends that investors should be fully aware of. With that in mind, in this edition of Pick Ten Meets, we are joined by Gerard Barron, CEO of The Metals Company. Gerard is a serial entrepreneur whose mission is to help wean humanity off of fossil fuels and transition to a circular resourced economy. So why don't we start first big picture? Clearly the, the impacts of human activity on our planet uh, have become uh, front and center in many ways. We've had so much of an effect that we now even have a new name for the geological era we're in. Uh, People or scientists are talking about the Anthropocene. It seems like things are quite dramatic right now, but if you take us maybe a little bit through uh, a, a broader geological view of the planet, you know, how, do, how do we stack compared to the longer term history uh, of planet Earth here? Well, the Anthropocene, it, it needs context, right? We desperately need temporal literacy. We, we need to know our Earth's past and future history, and looking at everything through the lens of human timescales is warping our understanding of the world. We're living on a, a world that has a beginning and an end. It's a world that has been changing for four and a half billion years and has had a, a few very eventful billion years ahead of it before it gets engulfed by the sun. And I think this is a fundamental thing to understand because it shapes the stories we tell ourselves about our home planet and our future on it. Our planet is currently habitable, but our planet is not exactly a safe haven for life. You know, life innovates through random mutations and death. And, and our planet has a track record of getting off kilter, getting tangled in positive feedback loops, and then taking millions of years to regain a form of equilibrium. And then came a new species called humans. And of course, most recently, the industrialization of our society. Within a blink of time, humans have become a, a very powerful agent of planetary change. And, and not necessarily for the better, we're adding a hundred times more CO2 into the atmosphere per year than all of the planet's volcanoes. And last time the CO2 was, was this high was like four million years ago. It's heating up our atmosphere and producing more extreme weather. And of course the oceans are more acidic than they were a century ago. And sea levels are now rising at 30 centimeters per century after they've been stable for 7,000 years. So we're moving 10 times more rock and sediment than all of the world's rivers. The species extinction rate is a thousand to ten thousand times is higher than normal. You know, we've run up against several planetary boundaries. We, we may already have unknowingly triggered our planet's infamous positive feedback loops. Our planet and life on it will be fine. It'll, it'll take several million years, but the planet will be fine. Human future on the planet is not assured though. We may very well be the most endangered animal on this planet. And, and the trouble is, at this point, we can't do a U-turn or stop. You know, there's 7.6 billion of us and we're expecting to add another 3 billion this century. We need to provide for us all. Yeah, 
we, we've touched a little bit on some of these planetary boundaries already. Um, and of course, there, there are many with problems, whether it's deforestation, whether it's chemical pollution, whether it's water scarcity. But clearly the one that uh, people are talking the most about these days uh, is climate change. It seems like uh, most of the talk is about uh, wind farms and uh, solar panels. Uh, that's definitely what's making the headlines. Um, your focus is a little bit different, right? So you, you've been focusing more on the, the minerals and, and metals. Uh, how does this fit into the broader equation around climate change mitigation? Well, we all agree that fossil fuels have delivered a heap of externalities, right, that we can now observe. So we all understand the way to stop using fossil fuels is to make the green clean transition, build batteries, drive electric vehicles. But of course, producing metals that are necessary to build these batteries hasn't been under the same scrutiny yet that is coming. And so when you add up all of the vehicles on the road that we're planning to electrify, when you add up all of the power stations that need to be converted to renewable power and the batteries that are needed to store the, the energy for when the wind, wind doesn't blow, and all the homes that need to be converted, we're talking about billions of tons of metals that are going to be needed to facilitate that. Now, you know, in the longer term, recycling will take care of a big part of that because, of course, battery metals are entirely recyclable. But the problem is we need to build a lot of batteries before they become recyclable. Where can we identify the lowest impact supply of these virgin ores? Because, you know, at the moment, if we just continue the path we're going, we're, just, we're going to continue ripping down our, our carbon sinks because this is where a lot of these battery metals exist. We're going to have to dis dislodge communities we're going to have to generate billions of tons of waste and tailings, which endanger human lives. And so, you know, this is where we need to rethink this. You know, Mother Nature has provided an abundant resource that sits on the bottom of the ocean. And what we're about is understanding how we can safely tap into that resource and make it available to make our batteries. So the metals company is all about collecting polymetallic nodules from the ocean floor. And these are basically an electric vehicle battery in a rock. And we can collect them and massively compress the environmental and social impacts compared to land-based alternatives. You know, what we have to understand though is what are the full life cycle analysis and impacts of the decisions we're making and the alternatives that sit in front of us. So for our viewers, uh, this concept of LCA or life cycle analysis is really a, a critical element in environmental assessment. Really, It's this notion that you want to understand the ecological footprint, uh, really cradle to grave, uh, and is really what is considered to be the state of the art here. It's something which uh, we apply uh, as investors when selecting uh, companies. I always ask people to, if we had our time again, and if we took a planetary perspective, we, we would carry out extractive industries in parts of the planet where there was the least life, right? We wouldn't go to the rainforests and rip all those down. We'd go to the deserts. And that's where these nodules sit. They sit in the most common area on the planet. It's called the abyssal zone. It just happens to be covered by 4,000 meters of water. So imagine a field, a, a, a golf driving range littered with golf balls. Uh, and, and that's what we have. These nodules literally lay on the ocean floor. So we're able to collect them and they form through precipitating the metals that are in the seawater or in the sediment upon which they sit. 100% of the mass of what we collect, we use. What if we build 1 billion EV batteries, 75 kilowatt batteries? We'll generate 13 gigatons of CO2 emissions if we use land-based ores. We can compress that by more than 90%. You know, last year there was 190 billion tons of waste generated through land-based mining. Compare that to only 2 billion tons of municipal waste. And the, the range of other impacts are equally impressive. You know, no tailings, no waste, much lower impact on biomass, much lower impact on biodiversity. 
And of course, the land that is used for mining can then be used for other purposes. It can be used for sequestering more carbon or for agriculture and, and making a more sustainable life. You've got to have your faith in science. You know, you've got to let the science provide the answers to some of this because, you know, it can be counterintuitive, right? Because we look at land and land-based mining and you think, oh my God, imagine if we carried that practice and put it into the oceans. But it's, but of course, it's not the same. They're very, very different in ecosystems and environments. I guess the question at this point is, this is relatively new as a practice. And uh, even though there are, there are many benefits that, that we've uh, discussed, how do you know that there aren't some blind spots in terms of possibly some areas where we could have side effects that we don't necessarily know? What, what are the areas that uh, you worry about potentially? Yeah, well, if I may, I'll just address the relatively new because, um, you know, these nodules were first found back in the 1870s and they've been studied since the 1960s. And what a lot of people don't realize is that in the 1970s, they started to collect these nodules. And so they solved a lot of the engineering challenges, the technical challenges back in the 1970s. So there's been a lot of science and understanding going on. And, you know, I, I always, uh, it raises hair on the back of my neck when people say we know more about the moon or Mars than we do about, you know, the deep ocean. Well, you know, wrong. We know a lot about the CCZ. We've had more than 6,000 scientific study days out there. Uh, my own company, the Metals Company, has completed 10 expeditions. We have this year, in fact today, uh, we have a science expedition setting sail from San Diego. It's the first of four that we will complete this year. It's a boat filled with scientists uh, because we've been studying the environmental uh, potential impacts uh, and you know the, both baseline and through the water column. And so we know a lot about this part of the ocean. We are already building what we call our digital twin, which will, which will make available to the regulator, the International Seabed Authority. We're also going to make it available to civil society because I, I think people are going to be really interested to see what's going on down there. They're going to be very interested to see the impacts. And of course, with adaptive management systems, you can move on the fly. You know, if you get more information because you have a digital twin, you, you, you can make changes. If you came across something interesting, then you could change direction. You know, I can't say with 100% certainty, but I can say with a very high degree of certainty that based on all of the scientific evidence we and others are gathering, that this is absolutely the, the best planetary decision on where we should be getting these metals from. Um, I'd like to, to conclude by, by coming back to this concept of uh, the circular economy, you know, which you, you touched on uh, briefly in, in your remarks. Uh, so a concept which uh, has been around for a long time, but which the uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation has popularized um, in more recent years. Can you tell us uh, what potential you see in, in the metals uh, space uh, for circularity to be fully incorporated? And you know, what's the potential? What are the limits? Well. You know, this is something that I'm super motivated by um, because we are dealing with an asset that is deemed the common heritage of mankind, right? Because we're in international waters, so it's kind of owned by everyone and should be developed for the good of everyone, especially developing nations. One of the benefits will be that we'll pay very handsome royalties, billions of dollars of royalties, back to the regulator, and those funds will then be distributed to developing countries. When our battery comes to end of life, it will be recycled. And I think consumers will support brands who use recycled materials. And so those brands will be forced to change their behavior as well. And I think that using virgin oils in the future will be very uncool. So I see our business sunsetting out of collecting nodules in the deep ocean to more of a recycling business. And of course, with distributed ledger technology, it means that, you know, we can keep track of these metals and eventually we won't sell these metals we will rent these metals on a return basis because we want them back so we can recycle them for future benefit so 
that's the only way you can tr create a true circular economy. And the metals company is pushing into a new frontier. You know, we have, you know, some big ambitions and some big challenges, but, you know, please come and join us for the journey.